everybody. Uh, so we're going to be doing a panel today about expanding your business in the US. Uh, my name is Thomas Smale. I'm founder of a company called FE International. We are an M&A firm that specializes in the sale of software, e-commerce, and content-based online businesses. Um, and for a little bit of context on me, we expanded our operations out into the US full-time about four years ago. And I now actually live in Boston, despite being from London originally. Um, so Claire and Yorick are going to be joining, and we're going to be talking a little bit about our experiences, and then there's places you guys can submit your questions. So I've got a few pre-planned, and then I'm going to answer anything you guys have, so please submit them, and I'll get to them in, in due course. So please welcome Claire and Ulrich when they are ready. So I'll just let them put that up so, Claire, would you like to quickly introduce yourself, tell everyone who I you are, what you do? Down. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Claire McHugh. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company, an Irish company called Axonista, and we have a video technology product. Um, typically, we sell to uh, large broadcasters that want to enable multi-screen interactive experiences. So we do things that you, um, enable the users to interact with the content when they're watching video or buy stuff from them. So uh, one of... Uh, an example of our customer would be uh, QVC, who are a global shopping channel, and we do all their um, shoppable video. And uh, also Sinclair Broadcast Group is another big US broadcaster. And in Ireland, we work with people like the Irish Film Institute, and we work with TV3 as well, which is the national broadcaster here. So our um, deal size value would be typically quite big. We're enterprise SaaS. Um, we have a team of 27 here in Dublin, and we are just opening our US office at the moment, which is which means I'm spending a lot of time on planes going back and forth to New York, uh, but it's a very, very exciting uh, phase of growth. Excellent, thanks. Yurik? Yeah, so we are a, we're a customer experience uh, SaaS platform coming out of kind of social media management. So to make that a little bit more concrete, uh, we kind of combine you know, a nice trinity of three things that has you know, previously been separate within social media management tools, monitoring, uh, your outbound content planning, keeping the window dressing right on all your different channels, and the engagement piece, sort of the unified social inbox. And uh, we do that specifically for you know, teams and enterprises, so we don't work with the kind of uh, the one-man armies and the small agencies. Uh, we work predominantly directly with, with brands of, of a good size and, um, and have, you know, which is a good kind of segue into this particular topic, we have we have a little bit of a different focal point in terms of um, ideal segment in Europe and the US, which we can get back to. Um, I like that Claire kind of led with, um, with the deal size because I think um, those are some of the things that's really important in terms of how you, how you set up your go-to-market and it's really important to get that right before you go to the US and then potentially change the flavor slightly, but not a lot. So we are in Ideal size is like in the 20Ks of ACV, uh, which enables you to do certain things as a go-to-market. There's you know, a good amount of CAC you can then spend um, to build that up. So we're, we are just shy of 200 people, 175 um, uh, FTEs, uh, 40 of those guys in New York City, um, where we have leadership presence and uh, quite a bit of salespeople there. Um, so we've gone to quite a few you know, trials and tribulations, have a bit of scar tissue setting that up. Um, but predominantly, it's a pretty classic, classical model, I guess, for a European company. Product engineering, a lot of the kind of global functions out of Europe. We're based in Copenhagen, where we originated from. I'm a Danish national myself. And then we, we built an inside sales model. We really got that right, I think, pretty early on at a time back in 2012, where there were not really a SaaS kind of sales go-to-market alumni to use. So we really kind of got our hands dirty and, and built that up. But I think we got that ready before we went to the US and we kind of had a framework to apply the growth and the scaling there. With. Cool, excellent. So thanks so much for the introductions. So let's start with why do you think it's important to expand into the US? And also, do you think everyone should do it? And if not, why? So 
Um, it's, well, it was important for us to expand into yeah. the US because, and before we really you know, took up an office space there and, and really you know, started to commit to that market more seriously, mm -hmm. um, probably 50% of our customers were US anyway. And they're um, concentrated in New York because of media companies, yeah. um, or at least they have a headquarters in New York so they can easily meet us. Um, or they're in LA, which is a secondary market of focus for us. But we're, we're really, we do see a lot of growth potential for us in New York, and that's the only reason why we're doing it. You know, you have to go where your customers are. Yeah, that makes sense. So that was going to be my question. My follow-up question to that is, do you think you have to go where your customers are? Yes. Or did you consider any other cities that weren't New York um, or LA? I think with the size of our team and the resources that we have, we probably need to focus on one area mm -hmm. first. And East Coast is an easier thing to do with us for time yeah. difference from uh, supporting from Ireland initially. Uh, my plans are to grow by the end of Q1 next year to have three or four people in that New York sales office. Awesome. Um, yeah, which would be really, really great. Um, but you, you kind of have to... It's an interesting thing as scaling something that is very Irish and, and entering a new market, which is very US. And there's a temptation to sort of try and blend in and fit in with the culture over there. But actually, you kind of have to lean into... We were talking this a little bit about this at dinner last night. You kind of have to lean into what makes you different yeah. um, and really mm. just embrace the things that make you stick out because there's so many other people. It's a very, very noisy market over there. Lots of people are competing for the same attention, competing for the same dollars. Yeah. So, um, and for, for me, you know, being Irish, being female, being a leader of a tech company, they're all things I can lean into. Mm -hmm. um, but also some tremendous support from the community as well. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, so, Yurik, have you got any, like, anything to add to that? Yeah, so, so there's a couple of things there, right? Um, I think, do you have to go to the US? I think for us, it was pretty clear early on that we were not in a market that was going to be a national or a regional play. So it really was kind of the same kind of social networks that people are using, same kind of marketing tactics on the Western Hemisphere, so that was probably our market. And so we decided pretty early on, I mean, even after we just raised our Series A, uh, we got some good things going on with the, the good metrics on our sales model and our, you know, our CAG payback was very nice. So I kind of went to the, to the first kind of, yeah, the first couple of sales guys that we had that were really kind of seasoned and said, hey, how about you, so these were based in Copenhagen, how about you come in, you know, you have lunch, you kind of sync up with US East Coast time with your work day, and we do outbound prospecting to, to the guys in, uh, in North America. And we got, you know, great response on that uh, really early on, which, which led us to kind of transplant a small beachhead on Broadway in shortly after having raised our Series A. Um, so but, but you definitely, if you can capture or kind of create a defensible position that's within a region, if, if that's a possibility, then try and do that perhaps before you do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. So my company, just to, to add part of the reason we moved out to the US is in m and specifically, a lot of the buyer activity is in the US. Mm -hmm. So we found we were operating out of a European headquarters and dealing primarily with US-based investors. So it does add, uh, so as a company, it made sense to be in the US, but I think this probably applies to everyone in the room. If you have a company and you're ever thinking about selling it, if you're already operating in the US, then you're a lot more attractive to a, a, a US-based acquirer. And there's a lot of M&A activity in the US uh, compared to like Europe and the rest of the world. So there are some a additional benefits just from a a business value perspective as well. Um, so we spoke about this a little bit over dinner last night, and I thought it was um, really interesting. But as Europeans, what advantages have you seen, like being European in a US market? So Claire, I know you slightly touched on that. So yeah, I mean, um, two things. First. We have an incredibly supportive Irish community in the US, particularly in New York, who's been very, very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, you're leaning into what makes you different. You, you do need to, to be noticed and get noticed. And, and the more that you can stand out with the marketing budgets that you have and how you can differentiate yourself, the better. Um, so there's a couple of people that have been particularly supportive. Um, it's not just Enterprise Ireland, but they're one of them. And there are, um, for anyone who doesn't know who Enterprise Ireland is, they're the local government association here, which helps, um, they really focus on scaling jobs here and um, also export 
to the US or anywhere in the world. They're, they're very focused on those two things. So they help companies that do that. Um, and then we also have uh, my, my bank, Bank of Ireland, has actually given me an office in Manhattan. It's awesome. Which is awesome. And it's on the 41st floor of Grand Central Tower. And I have a corner office. And I take photos of it all the time. Stick it on LinkedIn. If no one's seen them yet, you will. Um, and it's, it's just such a brilliant home to have, you know? Yeah. Um, but also, we have on our board a, an Irish person called Dermot McCormick, who's not only um, an industry professional um, for the last 20 years in our market, but has lived there for that time. Mm -hmm. Cool. So yeah. It's been very helpful. Yeah. So, I think if you just answer that question verbatim, what are the advantages? I don't think there is a lot. I frankly don't think there is. I think that um, you know you are against you know more funding, better talent, all this stuff. But so. But we, we had a few anecdotes of that, I guess. When, when our first sales guys, they, tried, they did outbound prospecting, they were very kind of focused on, hey, we're calling from Denmark. And when we, were, when we had made the flip and had our first office, they were like, hey, we're a Danish company, Danish design, all these things. And I was a little bit, hey, can we tone that down? We're trying to, you know, we're going to come over here and we're going to, you know, not be too exotic. But those kind of things actually worked, you know, getting an edge, edge in doing that. Um, and even though you no, know, you know, with 40 guys, uh, you know, in the sales force there, with U.S. passports, they still use these these things to to get an edge. Um, but I don't think there are a ton of advantages. I mean, we're a little bit more scrappy because of the fundraising environment and that's the kind mm -hmm. of that we have. So those would probably be it, I guess. So did you raise funding in Europe and then we, move out we did. than the other way around? Yeah. We our cap table looks like the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much does. Um, so we, we have not raised in the U.S. yet. We, we may. Um, uh, so we have some leadership there. I have a U.S. CFO. Um, and I think doing those type of things, after, if you're serious about it, you, you probably can't just do a, a small, scrappy office because the type of people you, you'll, you know, the team you'll build, they want to see that this is going places. And you kind of need to, you need to build that out so that, it, that you, you mean business. And I think that's, that's putting leadership there as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So from from my side, I think there are some uh, additional <laughs> benefits being European, operating in uh, the US. So one thing I found. So I do a lot of public speaking events like this, and I speak to international crowds all the time. And I found with uh, Americans, there are definitely some challenges. I guess any audience, if it's not being English, the average English person can understand me, but anyone else might struggle at times. So it's taken a lot of time and effort to speak more slowly, enunciate properly. Uh, and with the US, there are a lot of phrases and analogies that I might use day to day when I was back in the UK. But dealing in the US, you can't necessarily use and get away with. But there are definitely some advantages once you get around that, being that I feel like the average American would find you a lot more trustworthy. They'll say you're English or European. Mm. You seem, mm. seem more sound trustworthy. Um, which I think is a good thing, particularly in an industry like mine. It's M&A, we're selling a, a high-end product or service, effectively. So it's important to be able to build that, that trust, and that's 90% kind of, of the battle for me. Yeah. And I think for you guys as well, with enterprise-level products and services, it's, mm. it's important to have that trust. Well, it's, it's also important to build really authentic relationships with people. Yes. Um, and I, th I think you, know, you have to put the time in to do that. It's not something that... I have seen being automated yet, but yeah. it is really like getting to know them, getting to know their lives. And they'll tell you the last time they were in Ireland, you know? Yeah, it's absolutely. Like, oh, I was in Dublin and this, that, and the other. And then it's, mm. I'll tell them my list of things to do in Dublin, and then we have that little rapport yeah. going. And everyone so in the US loves, loves Ireland, well, or Irish people in general. We always are having a good time. Apparently. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks, that's really useful. So we've got a bunch of questions coming in. I think I'll move on to them now. Um, so the, the first one on here is any tips on how you overcame the operational? <laughs> challenges of multiple time zones and separate teams. Mm. Um, so I'll start with that one just from a little bit of my experience. So we currently have three offices. We have one in London, uh, and then we have Boston, which is a five-hour time difference. And then we have Saigon in Vietnam, which is a 11 or 12-hour difference from Boston, depending on the time of the year. So I'm used to dealing with kind of three different teams, three different uh, countries. I think the key with that that we found is centralized systems. So probably not going to be able to do face-to-face -face, uh, meetings that often with your team. So we use an internal communication platform. We use HipChat, which is an Atlassian product, very similar to Slack. Uh, so we found that things like keeping things internal 
and then having weekly meetings scheduled in that hit all of the time zones are important. Um, and just being really clear with what people need to, to do. I think it's quite easy for people to forget what they're supposed to be doing if their leader is in a different country and they're not, they're not clear. But if you've got people and they've got very clear goals and targets in mm. mind, um, then that can work quite well. Uh, and with the multiple time zones, to be honest, I've found it's just something you get used to. I'm so used to now like being up either really early or working really late. And I think if you're not willing to do that, then you might want to reconsider mm. the practicalities. Because sometimes, while well, hopefully you build out a good team that can manage things in your absence, sometimes as a business owner or, or founder or whatever your position might be, you are going to have to be up at one in the morning on the phone, and it's kind of unavoidable. Um, so I think, yeah, centralize things and just accept the fact that you're building an international business. Mm. You just have to deal with the fact that sometimes you have to be up early or work late. And if you don't choose the West Coast, then you'll actually get some sleep. Yes. <laughs> um, so I think that's the real trick, right? I think we, I was really focused also pretty hellbent on the East Coast, and then with our first prospecting, where we saw the most traction, a lot of, a lot of stuff around New York. So that was fortunate. I think there was a lot of confirmation bias that, oh, yes, we'll definitely go to New York City instead of you know, all the other places you could go. So, so I think that, that's what we did. So I think that's just, that's just uh, pretty important. Yeah, and yeah, no, I think that makes sense. It's part of the reason we chose Boston. And I think both of you guys, New York, so mm. I think that makes sense. But also, yeah. I mean, we have a few customers in LA, so it's, we just come in a bit later and go home a bit later. Mm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, exactly. It's, you know. Yeah, I don't, think there's any, I don't think there's any perfect solution to it. Um, and, unless, obviously, as your teams grow, hopefully you'll build out. Yeah. Like we have managers that operate the different offices, so it's not like I'm managing the team yeah. day to day. Yeah. I think that's, that's, the that's goal. important. Yeah. Mm. Um, so uh, here's another good one. So would you hire a new person in the US or send someone from your own office to set it mm. up? Uh, we think the latter. Um, so what we did uh, when we permanently opened our Boston office is my business partner and one of our employees got visas to move over there and set the office up um, themselves and then hired out a team. Um, depending what visa you get, if anyone wants to learn more about visas, feel free to grab me after because it gets very detailed and c complex Fine. and takes a very long time. Um, but we got visas that meant that we can be there for five to seven years, depending on uh, the person who moved. And we found that's the best way because you really want to build your culture in the US. You want it to be as similar as possible to the rest of your company. Otherwise, you find that from an operational perspective, you're effectively running two completely separate mm. companies. So yeah. we found that was really important. Um, obviously, from a personal perspective, it's a big sacrifice if you're married or have kids. Moving halfway across the world is a lot to think about. Much like the, the time zone issue, it's one of those things that I think is uh, unavoidable. Either you're willing to make that sacrifice or, or you're not. But I think, ultimately, if you're going to do it long term, it's important to be willing, to, willing or able to move. Um, but yeah, from our perspective, it was definitely move someone internally. Um, it's mm. a lot of work and personal sacrifice, but yeah. it's, it's paid off really well for, for us. Yeah, I, I think it, it's unrealistic to kind of drop ship in, hire a team, and then try to do anything remotely. You really need somebody to, to relocate. You need to be there, don't you? Yeah, you, you need to be there a lot as, yeah. you, as you build up that, that organization. I mean, um, I have not relocated myself. That's for a, a number of reasons. You know, I have... We have a pretty rowdy market where we need to get the product market fit right. And we have all a product in Europe and we have a sizable European business. So it didn't seem like the, the right thing to do. Um, and then I you know, sent my first head of sales and a VP commercial ops uh, guy to the US, uh, which gave comfort that that was actually the exact things that we were doing there. And we would have the data to back up when somebody come back. You know, you have US sales guy called Bob comes back and say, you know, Ulrich, in the US it's really quite different. And <laughs> you know, the data shows that it isn't, so let's get cracking. Those type of things you need to you have in you need to have in place. Yeah, that makes sense. But also um, I would say that you know, you just have to get out there, get to know that market. Even if you're not gonna relocate, just try and be there as much as possible. Like my, myself and my co founder, we split the time between us, so one mm -hmm. of us is usually in the New York office. Yeah. Um, but also, I've been interviewing tons and tons and tons of salespeople mm -hmm. to get the right person because you can really undo a lot of the good work that you've done by getting the wrong person. Yes, absolutely. But you also need somebody who knows that market and has a, you know, a network that works yeah. for what you wanna do. Uh, and sometimes, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes 
like hiring is usually one of the biggest challenges for any mm. founder. So sometimes it's tempting to just hire people even if you're not 100% sure they're going to be the right fit. But we've yeah. like learned that the hard way. It's really yeah. important to yeah. hire the right people that are a cultural fit. Yeah. And that's challenging in an international organization. Mm. But yeah. we found that, I'd say, of our team of nearly 30 people, um, we only have a few that are actually mm. American, born in America, or have American. We have kind of a, a real diverse range in the team. So we're not, while it is a US office, I don't think all of them would consider themselves like American as such. I think that's important in an mm. international company, mm. just because the cultural differences are quite um, wide. Um, OK, so I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, I'm sure Claire and Europe will be hanging around afterwards, and so will I. So if anyone's got any specific questions, I know Claire is go going through the visa process at the moment. Yeah. I've been there, done that. And a, a lot of the questions that have come up are uh, legal related. I've purposely ignored those just because I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I don't want to give any advice that's going to get any of you in, in trouble. But I do have some, a good attorney recommendation if anyone's interested um, in like getting a visa or incorporating. Uh, and anything related to accounting, I, I've skipped over as well. Again, that's uh, an accounting question rather than something that I can necessarily help with. Um, so thanks very much to Yorick and Claire. I'm now going to um, introduce Mark McLeod from Shorepath Capital. Uh, but firstly, quick round of applause for Yorick and Claire. Thank you.